Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Liz Casson, and I am Issue One's Campaigns Manager. Um, I do a lot of work with our Faces of Democracy campaign, um, and I'm really excited to help introduce this great conversation and this great panel that we have today uh, with four members of our Faces of Democracy campaign. Um, but just to kick off the conversation and frame the discussion and then introduce our panelists. Um, I'm really excited to be able to, to introduce Carla, Carla Bernal uh, with Pivotal Ventures, who again is going to frame the conversation, tell us a little bit about the great work that Pivotal Ventures does, and then introduce our wonderful panelists for a conversation. Uh, just one thing I will note uh, as we go, please feel free to use the Q&A function within the Zoom webinar. Um, we will leave some time for questions towards the end of the discussion. Uh, so don't be shy and don't be afraid to put your questions uh, in the Zoom Q&A function. And so with that, Carla, I will pass it on over to you. Thank you, Liz. And good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here today and happy Women's History Month. Um, it's nice to be here in this capacity. I've been an avid supporter of Issue One as a funder even before I joined Pivotal Ventures and even happier to do so now in this capacity. Again, my name is Carla Bernal. I'm here representing Pivotal Ventures. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Pivotal Ventures is a social impact incubation company founded by Melinda French Gates, who in 2019 committed $1 billion to expanding women's power and influence in the United States. And central to this $1 billion commitment is really our goal to advance women's political power in this country. And we do this in a few ways. First, by increasing women's representation in state level office. Second, and very relevant to this conversation today is by strengthening our democratic systems and our, in, in particular, our elections to ensure that they are secure and accessible and safe to participate in. And then most importantly, using our platform to elevate women leaders in the pro-democracy space, which is why I'm so thrilled to celebrate and introduce our panel today. Now, a few uh, framing comments uh, that are really important, especially for a conversation. Many people are not um, aware that 80% of our election officials from county clerks to poll workers are actually held by women. And as we navigate, through this election season's unprecedented challenges and complex political landscape, I think it's crucial more than ever to amplify the leadership roles of our panelists today. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to spotlight the incredible women who work tirelessly behind the scenes to uphold the integrity of our democracy. And these four women are exemplary representatives of the thousands of women election workers and officials from across the country who make our democracy work. So you're in a good conversation today. Today's panel features New Mexico Secretary of State, Secretary Maggie Toulouse Oliver, who also served as a county clerk prior to becoming secretary. We'll also be joined by Weld County, Colorado clerk, Carly Copas, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin Elections Commission's Executive Director, Claire Woodall. Moderating this distinguished panel is Amber McReynolds, also a longtime thought partner of Pivotal Ventures, who currently serves on the USPS Board of Governors, is a member of the National Council on Election Integrity, and is also a former election official from Denver, Colorado. So I'm very excited for you all to hear from these four incredible women, um, all of whom are again issue one's members of Issue One's Basis of Democracy campaign. So I'll hand it over to you, Amber. Thank you so much, Carla, and thank you to you and the incredible team at Pivotal Ventures for making such an investment, such an important and critical investment in expanding women's representation and ensuring it's fair at all levels of government, as well as in business and society, because um, we certainly need more, more folks just like Pivotal and your incredible team to focus on this and really invest in improving this, because you mentioned 80% of women, uh, of election officials are women, but also the United States is, is ranked 75th in the world in women's representation. And so I thank you and your incredible team for ensuring that this remains a top issue. And thank you to Issue One for hosting such an important uh, discussion in Women's History Month. And 
um, especially with these incredible women election officials that you're going to hear from today. I'm just delighted to be here with all of them and appreciate their continued work uh, to ensure our democracy is, is secure and safe and fair for everyone to participate. Um, and, and nothing could be more important than uh, the work of election officials as really, as I like to describe them, the, the guardians of our democracy on the front line. So, uh, so with that, really excited to open the panel today. And I wanna start um, with this incredible panel. And I think what, what Carla mentioned too, she mentioned that Secretary Toulouse Oliver was also a local official. So all of the folks today have administered elections at the local level and Secretary Toulouse Oliver, one of the very few secretaries in the country right now that was a local official before. And so a really unique perspective for, from her as well. Um, so I wanna start and kick off a question for all of you. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll kind of call on a, a, a few of you in the order um, to go through since we are on Zoom and it's always hard to uh, make sure that we get the order right. Um, so the first question, how do you how did you get into this line of work? And Secretary Toulouse Oliver, I'd love to start with you and then we'll go to Claire and 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 Carly uh, following you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Amber, dear friend of mine, longtime colleague. Um, and issue one, thank you for hosting this event. And I'm really pleased to be here with these amazing colleagues at the local level. Um, so as, as Amber mentioned, and as Carla mentioned, I was a county clerk for 10 years. Um, that's not my start in politics and government. I worked for 13 years, basically worked my way through college and grad school as a campaign intern and issue advocate. Um, I ran the New Mexico Office of the League of Conservation Voters. I spent a long, long time educating, getting folks registered to vote, telling them where, when, and how to cast their ballots. And through those years here in New Mexico, as somebody who really worked to help folks vote, it was really hard uh, because there were not that many opportunities. Early voting only started in New Mexico back in the early 2000s. Um, we only had in-person at your precinct on election day for a long, long time. So when my uh, term of, uh, of work with LCV came to an end, it just so happened that my local county clerk in Bernalillo County, New Mexico, had been elected secretary of state, vacating uh, the rest of her term. And the county commission was looking for applicants for folks to take over the county clerk role. And at that point, spending so many years educating voters, registering them, letting them know how to vote, I knew the voter side of the equation and thought that's what this office really needs. So I and of others through my uh, our hats in the ring and the county commission picked me and at 30 years old I started my uh, now 17 year career in election administration and uh, it's been incredible uh, many tough days many better days but um, so glad that I, I I threw my name in the hat for that and we're all lucky that you did too so thank you for your incredible service um, Claire over to you Thank you so much. Uh, my similar, my story is not too dissimilar um, in that I came from a background working in nonprofits, um, specifically community organizing, and ended up meeting the former executive director at the time. He was the deputy director of the election commission, but had always, in my nonprofit capacity, been frustrated by the lack of measurable outcomes. And so we oftentimes say he rescued me from the nonprofit world at the time, um, and that specific nonprofit has done a lot of transformation, but I became the city's first full-time permanent voter registration person. Um, and so for me, it was the perfect blend of still doing a lot of community work, community uh, engagement, public speaking, training, special registration deputies, but then the part of me that felt like something was missing was the data-driven person who loves all of the database management, all of the process and procedure um, that we all know goes into keeping our voter databases up to date, accurate, um, and was just really fulfilling. And I kind of fell into election administration and this is now my 11th year. Amazing, thanks, Claire. Uh, Carly, you're up. 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me to sit on this panel with everybody. Uh, and I definitely have to echo kind of what Claire said. I literally fell into this. Uh, I graduated high school in May of 2004 and started as a temporary worker in elections in June of 2004. And so this is my 20th year in elections. And trust me when I tell you this was not planned. This was not what I was planning on doing with my adult life or career. And that's just kind of how uh, elections hit you sometimes. Uh, we often say, you know, once election gets into your blood, it's kind of in your blood forever. Uh, and we always send, end up being a part of it. And so, like I said, I started out as a temporary worker, working that presidential year in 2004, uh, then earned a full-time position, worked my way up in the office from a frontline voter registration person, all the way up to managing our vote centers and all of our uh, in-person voting locations. And then ultimately, the clerk that I worked for got termed out. And at the age of 27, I decided, why not me? Uh, and so I decided to throw my ring into the hat. And at the age of 28, I was elected to be the clerk and reporter. And so I'm now serving my 10th year in my third and final term uh, as the Well County clerk and recorder. And I've just absolutely loved really essentially growing up uh, in elections. Uh, I have a family that was always very politically involved. I have other family members who served in elected positions. So I kind of always was the small kid at the county assemblies and state assemblies running around growing up, uh, but never actually thought I would be in a position to support uh, and actually work in elections. Uh, and that is where the path has led me. And here I am today uh, as the 29th clerk and recorder. Thanks, Carly. And what, and what an incredible story, really, from all of you. And Carly, I just, what you just said, I, I've, I've heard, you know, a number of folks that started as temporary, uh, temporary, in temporary jobs in various election offices. In fact, I had a couple of people that went on to be election directors that worked with me on a temporary basis in Denver, and they went on to, to be a director somewhere else. Um, and I want to just highlight on that note, uh, issue one was part of putting out a, a study um, at the end of 2023 about the federal work study program, which um, basically allows partnership between colleges and universities. And uh, they've, the Department of Education has now clarified that that federal work study program can extend to election offices and help college students get placed there in temporary jobs or as election judges and be able to work through the federal work study program. So I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's so relevant for all the stories you shared and the, and the discussion today. Um, okay, for the, for the next uh, kind of topic that I wanted to hear all of your perspectives on, um, really touches on how elections have changed in recent years. So election officials have gone from relatively being, being government officials that were you know, running an administrative process, largely out of the spotlight, uh, if you will. Uh, and, and that's changed significantly really since 2020. Um, so I'd love to have each of you talk about how that change has, has affected your job, how it's changed over the last few years, what additional responsibilities you've had to take on because of uh, some of the Miss and disinfo and other and other threats and 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 security issues that you've seen change the nature of your job. Um, and this time, Carly, why don't we start with you first, uh, and then we'll go around. Thank you. And it definitely has changed a lot uh, from twenty years ago, even ten years ago, even four years ago. Uh, the amount of new and different areas we really have had to dive into to know and boost not only ourselves, but our elections team, the amount of cybersecurity knowledge and infrastructure that we have to now have a very in-depth and thorough knowledge about, uh, kind of having to feel like we got to all have minors in computer sciences now, <laughs> which I didn't actually do in college. So I now wish I did, because I think we all need that courses. Uh, then also with the influence of social media, I mean, that has dramatically changed, uh, in my opinion, since 2016 is when we first kind of got a taste of when social media was going to be a player in our world. And then obviously since 2020, it's been a massive player uh, in our world now. And so really trying to build stronger messaging uh, in a very short time frame, trying to get a very big message down to 30 seconds has definitely been an interesting challenge across the nation. 
which I think most of us are starting to really get a good grasp on. Uh, but doing that communication and that voter outreach and that voter education uh, is really key and important. And I definitely have seen that aspect grow immensely over the last eight, four to eight years, being able to have that communication, not only just going out in public and saying that, but trying to get it uh, to be educational on not only the media's part, but also trying to get social media uh, to help in different aspects because as we all have seen, uh, when one tiny little flame uh, goes off in social media, it can spread like wildfire. And the biggest challenge for all of us has definitely been trying to match that same bandwidth of the original wildfire that was spread. So that's definitely been an increasing challenge and definitely way different and a big challenge and change uh, even from 20 years ago. Would we have normal communication with our voters by sending them a letter or putting something in the newspaper? And, and now that really isn't sufficient enough uh, to be able to reach the people that we're needing to reach. Uh, and along with the misdis and malinformation front, I think that's been a massive change. We all have had to experience prior to 2020 and 2016, we've all had to experience with people questioning the outcomes, but it wasn't ever to this level of intensity. And so making those adjustments, making sure that our team is solid, making sure our building security is solid, a lot of different things have come into play uh, and have changed significantly since my first election in 2004, which my county didn't even have 100,000 registered voters at that time. And now my county is up to 250,000 registered voters. That's a significant change uh, in a lot of different processes and procedures. But then on the public front has definitely been the most dynamic change that I have personally seen uh, in the last 20 years. Thanks, Carly. Uh, Claire, um, being in a state, such a pivotal swing state, Wisconsin, you are you constantly have the spotlight on you. Just would love to hear your you know, thoughts on this question of, of how things have changed and, and how you're responding to it. Yeah, I think since 2020, the biggest thing that we've seen is the need to rebuild trust with our voters. Um, with us, you know, Wisconsin was the first election, the first state to hold a statewide election in the midst of the pandemic. We didn't delay our in-person voting in April of 2020. And what that meant for the city of Milwaukee was that we were only able to open up five voting centers and we saw voters waiting in huge lines, lots of voters who were not able to cast their ballot. And so that kind of started the distrust um, voters not getting their ballots in the mail because the post office, you know, when we think back to those timelines, we were all having weeks, um, less than a month to adjust to a brand new world. And so then when we see since 2020, um, candidates not accepting the results, the continuing of the misinformation lawsuits, what I've found is while even if we're not the specific topic of that lawsuit or of that candidate's distrust, any type of error in our work, um, which, you know, we all strive for 100% perfection, but last week, and we're in the middle of our presidential primary, there was an error with a ballot being mailed to the wrong ward. Um, and so any type of human error then gets, can take on a life of its own, um, and really kind of create that narrative of can our elections be trusted? Can our election administrators be trusted? And I think what used to be such an easy, explainable human error now automatically is approached kind of with mistrust as well. So I think that's the biggest challenge and biggest change we've seen is, you know, I am all about open honest, transparent processes. And I was told by a communications colleague last week, maybe you gave them a little too much detail on that because I sent our processes and our procedures. And I had to laugh because the reporter actually ended up calling me back and saying, appreciating that I explained in detail the process to her so that she could explain it to voters. So it's really balancing. Sometimes if you give too much information, that can then be attacked as well. Um, but really just battling, we already work in stressful, you know, way too much volume for the amount of staff we all have, but how do you best communicate when those errors occur, because they will occur, um, and really maintain that trust in the current political environment. Thank you, Claire. 
Uh, so Secretary Toulouse-Oliver, so I want to list a couple of things that you've been involved with related to this question, and, and I want to hear your perspective about all of this, but you served as president of NAS during a lot of this, of a lot of this period of time that has occurred. You've been heavily involved in the cybersecurity implementations with DHS, and I think within the last few days, New Mexico was listed as number one on the MIT Election Data Science Lab. Uh, as being the top state from a from a performance and on various metrics. So just would love your perspective, like given all of that, I mean, you are on the front, the, the front and center of this, especially at the state level, you're in a leading state on a number of, of issues. Congratulations, by the way. Um, and would love to hear your perspective about how you see things changed over the last four years and how you've been able to do all these things uh, <laughs> as part of that. <laughs> well, Thank you. Um, just yes, we are absolutely elated in New Mexico to be ranked number one in the MIT Election Performance Index. It has been almost two decades worth of incredibly tireless work uh, by so many of us in New Mexico at the election official level. The legislators, our current governor uh, and, and our former governor Richardson, uh, who passed away recently, who were also supportive. Um, so we definitely take it as a as a team effort. And, and we are very proud um, because that dedicated work um, has made a difference. And it's it's moved the metrics as as my fellow uh, election official uh, likes to talk about. We we care about data in elections because it tells us something. It tells us whether things are working or not. Um, so in the last four years, so yes, in 2020, I was the president of the National Association of Secretaries of State. And what was really interesting was when you know COVID really first hit, um, I can tell you, we came together very strongly as statewide election officials. Of course, not all uh, chief election officials in the state are secretaries of state. Uh, some like in Wisconsin, where my other colleague here is from, uh, have appointed officials. Um, that are not the Secretary of State, but we came together, we were communicating very closely, we were sharing best practices, states that were all vote by mail states, were telling the other states, here's how you do it. Um, and then very quickly, of course, as we know, the rhetoric changed. Uh, because frankly, the person who was in the White House and wanted to stay in the White House, uh, didn't want to see a whole lot of voting turnout and, and started causing a lot of uh, mis and disinformation to come out there. And, and I'm going to say that, you know, I'm a I'm a politically elected official and, and I want the same kind of trust in our election process that my colleagues have talked about. That's why I take my political hat off when I enter the door uh, to the secretary of state's office. But it is true that we've never had to deal with the kind of distrust, scrutiny, mis and disinformation, and threats and harassment as election officials that we've had to deal with in the last 20 years. I was personally in hiding at my partner's home in Albuquerque. I live in Santa Fe um, in 2021, early 2021, when the insurrection against the Capitol happened, watching it on TV from there. Why was I in hiding? Because my life was threatened. I had been doxxed. Uh, by the Iranian government, along with several of my other fellow election officials uh, for doing our jobs and trying to perpetuate the myth that the 2020 election was stolen. That's not something I'd ever had to deal with in my previous 13 years of election administration experience, no matter how heated things got. I've been to court a million times. I know my other uh, colleagues here have been to court too. That's part of the deal, going to court. But worrying because you do not feel physically safe and you don't uh, feel like your family is physically safe is a whole other, uh, you know, issue. And you know, we we live in a in a democracy. We don't live in a banana republic. Um, that's never okay. It is never okay for political rhetoric, which of course we want to foster, you know, discussion and debate in our democracy, but to rise to the level of threats or actual political violence. So, in in certainly in my personal experience. I echo the other challenges my colleagues have mentioned. I, I totally agree with both of them. And the threats of violence and harassment um, have also been just a, a new level of, of real difficulty for election officials in this country. Thank you for that. And I, I want to pull out, so you just mentioned the threats and the harassment, um, Secretary Toulouse-Oliver, and I, I'd love to have both Claire and Carly weigh in on this and, and how it's impacted you. And Secretary, please jump in again to, you know, ex it kind of expand on the comments that you just made. But 
you know, we've heard about this increase in threats and harassment. We've seen it very deliberately. You just outlined and gave a few examples and really would like to hear from all of you about how it's impacted you, how it's impacted your families and how you uh, see these threats as different for women or uh, individuals from historically marginalized groups. Because we often see that a lot of the studies have shown that, that the rhetoric and the violent rhetoric, especially against women in politics is is much worse uh, than than with male counterparts. So would love to hear all of your perspectives about that and and how you see, you know, what what perhaps strategies um, there might be or what you use as strategies to to stay safe, but also uh, keep showing up and keep taking a stand and keep keeping your strength up. Claire, we, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I think for me, you know, the fir very first most important thing was to let my employers know when I didn't feel safe. Um, in 2021, I became the target of a lot of online phone, one threat in the mail to my home. Um, and I wasn't quiet about it. And I went and I said, we need additional security. We need to, at the time, you could walk straight into my office, jump over the front desk and walk right in. Um, and so really advocating and not being afraid to advocate for what you need. Um, but it's been very, I think, I mean, I think it's been very difficult on a lot of people's families. Election administration alone is a very difficult profession to be in, especially for mothers, where our lives are dictated by very fast paced time. You know, uh, an election's not going to be put on hold because you have a sick child. Um, and so you're already used to adjusting. But then no matter what you do, not feeling like you're able to take care of your family and your home and make everyone feel safe is just very defeating. I don't think anyone, no matter what their profession, should have to feel on guard 24-7, um, especially not for administering an election accurately and transparently and fairly. Um, so I know for me, that's been definitely an adjustment. And, you know, we've done basic things like having an alarm system and remaining more vigilant. And, you know, I've gone out of state to visit my family when the threats first came about. I had a newborn child, was on maternity leave, but I was in a, fortunately in a place where I could leave. Um, but I think that there's a lot we could do, starting with just funding for election security and infrastructure for the people who are actually doing the work. Um, but certainly it has helped in my situation to have the support of the those who control the purse strings around me. I'm not an elected official. I'm appointed by the mayor, um, but I've had nothing but support whenever I express security needs, whether it's for myself or for my staff and our physical infrastructure. Um, so I think that that can make a huge difference in making someone feeling confident that I am safe when I come to work and when I'm doing my job. So I have that support. Thank you, Claire. And um, you just mentioned something that is a commonality amongst all of us. So we've all been election officials with newborns. And I'm, I, I'm starting to think, and Carly is the newest of all of us with, uh, with a new baby. And we have a colleague in Colorado that also uh, had a baby, I think, a week after the election last November, and and was was there all all night um, for election night. But I'm, I also think there's a you know there's a resilience that you build as a mom, uh, and and it seems like there's a commonality that I often hear uh, with with especially moms that are uh, in this very difficult environment. Uh, Carly, over to you. Thank you. I de yeah, I definitely would say we've all definitely become lionesses for sure. And very protective, not only of our families, but of our team, because we do spend more time with our elections team than we do even our own families. And so I definitely feel also very lioness and protective over uh, my elections team because we are here day in and day out, long hours, because uh, the election day does not change. We've got to do it and it's going to come and we're ready or not, we got to do it. And so uh, some of the things that I have had to in ex experience is obviously since the last presidential election, it has been one party over the other kind of pushing the uh, conversation and the false narrative. And I am a member of that party. And so I'm I'm one that has been 
uh, very much attacked and chastised and even have a hashtag created about me uh, because I have stood against my own party. I have stood in saying, no, this is the truth and I'm going to stand with the truth. Uh, and this is what's actually the correct information. I'm going to stand with the correct information. And so uh, me and some of my other colleagues here in Colorado who are also fellow Republicans, uh, we kind of go into those lion dens or those snake pits or whatever you'd like to call them. And, and we stand our ground and we have those conversations. I try to be as graceful and understanding with these people as possible, but there definitely have been some that I've had to engage with law enforcement about. I actually have a gentleman that he lives literally across from my office here uh, and that uh, I teasingly say, you know, one day, could you just send me flowers instead of the lovely emails that you send me every, one, uh, every week? But still have not gotten any flowers from that gentleman. Uh, instead, he his his memes and his wonderful uh, emails that he gets sent to me get sent straight over to my sheriff, DA, and FBI contact because that is unfortunately the level that some people have decided to take their frustrations and their misunderstanding of what we do uh, to that level, unfortunately. So I definitely feel the secretary and also Claire as well. Uh, we have all had to endure things that I don't think any of us would have ever imagined five to six years ago that we would have to endure, uh, especially some of the items that we have seen, particularly as women, uh, I actually did kind of try and keep my pregnancy uh, as hidden as I possibly could. Uh, when I did go on to interviews, I, I asked that the media and the camera people position the camera in a certain way. So again, that they weren't actually noticing my, my big growing belly. <laughs> and so those are some of the things that I never thought I would have had to have considered is trying to hide a pregnancy so that the crazies aren't out there trying to now target. Uh, I did get to the point I got so large that it was kind of hard for me to not hide my pregnant belly. And, and it was unfortunate that then they started to make comments and suggestions towards my unborn child. Uh, and that was very uh, not okay in my world. Uh, it was very eye-opening and on and at some points I was it was very saddening because I was also at that time considering if I was going to run for my last and final term. And between my husband and I, there were a lot of conversations that we did have to have. And it was very serious conversations uh, because we were going to be welcoming a child into this world. And so it was not a great fun time uh, for the past four years. Uh, I've had en endured uh, death threats, which I'm sure everybody else I know on this panel has as well. And having to adjust to that, uh, working with my local law enforcement and coming into the office at different hours, not staying as late as I normally do or leaving at different times and parking in the parking lot, different spaces. I, it's kind of a running joke with my staff now. Uh, if Carly's wandering, it's because she can't remember where she parked <laughs> because I have to park in different parking spots every time I leave and come to the building uh, and and taking different routes to and from my office to home and shopping at different grocery stores. Those are some of the things that most of us, I believe, have had to adjust to over the last four years and especially myself. And it's been uh, challenging, especially uh, when I have worked uh, with other colleagues who are fellow Republicans, and we do uh, stand up against kind of our own party, essentially, uh, it's, it's interesting how my male counterparts are able to have a quicker understanding of what they're saying and a little bit higher respect when I can say the exact same thing and uh, I get not as quick of accepting and understanding. And I do face more of the derogatory type of remarks uh, when it comes to those conversations and especially online. Uh, that's where keyboard warriors have definitely felt that because I am a female, that apparently I deserve a harsher comments and words. Uh, and even with voicemails and even phone calls, uh, there have been times where I've had to hang up on some people due to the words that they are saying to me and, uh, and calling me. So it's definitely been a very hard challenge uh, but I'm definitely not one who is easily intimidated. That's why I will continue to show up. I will continue to uh, kind of have those conversations and and try to be the adult in the room, show as much grace as I possibly can, uh, but also show them that they are not intimidating me. I do know that I'm standing with the truth. I am on the right side of the history, and I have fellow colleagues across the nation, uh, as you're seeing with these two great ladies here, uh, fighting and doing the same thing, and I'm happy to lock arms and arms with everybody uh, across this nation, no matter what party, because it is important that all of us stand united 
uh, in this time, and especially as ladies, uh, because again, it's definitely been uh, an interesting time with the comments that I have seen and the different tone and different comments I have seen between my male colleagues and myself. Thank you for and sharing, Carly. And I, um, goodness, thank you for the specificity. I, I, you know, just, it's just awful that, that our civility and everything within a community is, is deteriorating in that way that people think it's okay to target uh, you and, and Claire, your, the, the examples you gave. And, and now Secretary Toulouse-Oliver would love to hear uh, from your perspective. I, I just have a couple of, of quick observations that I think line up um, with, with what my colleagues have said already. Um, first of all, you know, uh, where Carly's concerned, I, I want to take a, a special moment to thank and appreciate my Republican colleagues um, for the work that they've done. Of course, my Democratic colleagues have stood up very strong as well and gone through a lot of, you know, hate and threats as well. But, um, it, you know, it, it's it's even harder, I think, when you are standing up uh, to your own party uh, and to or, or should I say to folks who claim to be members right uh, of your same party. Um, that's really tough. And I know that um, as women, um, we certainly get, you know, some of the more disgusting, uh, violent uh, threats. And the other thing that lines up with that that I've noticed from the stories many of my male colleagues have told and mind you the male colleagues uh, that I've noticed um, who have the worst stories to tell are these Republican colleagues who are standing up to tell the truth uh, and to do the right thing and to run elections with honesty and integrity and the kind of threats they receive are not just against themselves they are largely against the women in their families their wives, their daughters. My colleague, Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, who is a, a pretty famous example of all this, his daughter-in-law, uh, his son is deceased. His daughter-in-law, they uh, treat and protect like their own, has been followed, uh, running errands, doing daily shopping, being recorded, uh, being stalked at her home, these types of things. And so isn't it interesting that where we have these male colleagues doing the right thing, when the threats come up and the harassment comes up, yes, of course it is against them, but it's also against the women in their lives. Uh, and that is extremely obviously wrong. Um, and it just paints that picture just a little bit more, right? About where they think we as election officials are vulnerable. Because we, those of us on this call and 80% of us nationally are women or because of the women in our male colleagues' lives. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you all for the specificity and just the examples. And you know, I it gives me it. it on, you know, I honestly got chills just listening to you guys about the fact that you know you're going every day to try to provide service to your constituents and provide a a, a great election for your for your customers uh, of our democracy. And then then just the things that you face outside of the office and even within the office because of lies, disinfo, bad info. Um, all of it. So I just thank you all again for your strength and courage. And um, please let anyone here in this community know how we can best support you, which is part of my, what my next question actually um, for all of us to talk about is. Um, so first, I would really love your perspective about how the what you think the federal government could do ahead of the 2024 election to make sure election officials like yourself have the resources and protections needed to continue to administer safe and secure elections. And obviously the budget had a, a, a smallish uh, allocation uh, in it. And certainly there's been, been more talk amongst many of us for years about the need for more sustainable funding, but just curious as to other things, whether it be law enforcement or other resources or protections that you see as being needed and critical for, for 2024. Uh, Secretary Toulouse-Oliver, can we start with you? Sure, um, you know, I work, so, you know, I'm, I'm obviously sort of in between the, the, the local election officials level on this panel and, and the federal uh, government. And so I spend a lot of my time, of course, as you mentioned at the beginning, Amber, working with the federal government. I've been on um, the, the election infrastructure subsector government 
coordinating council, uh, a lot of alphabet soup there uh, with DHS and CISA, the Cyber and uh, Infrastructure Security Agency to work to protect our election systems. A huge focus of that over the last couple of years in particular has been physical security. And so I know that I and my colleagues around this uh, country are working together in particular uh, on physical security and uh, the FBI DOJ partnership, um, sort of attempting to address physical threats and violence. Um, we in my state passed a law uh, to make it particularly uh, offensive and, and create a felony offense for harassment and threats of election officials. Um, but we do need more federal funding. We do need more tools and resources and particularly any that they can do help us spread that net downward to the county officials that I'm here on the panel with and their staff and their poll workers who are really the ones at the end of the day running these citizen run elections, those volunteer individuals, um, all the tools and resources we can get and money. Great, thank you so much. And, and Carly, I, I just wanna to turn to you because I know you, you've obviously been working on the funding issue and and I know Colorado's made some improvements in terms of reimbursement from the state largely led by the county clerks and 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 continuing to push for more support but really curious about your position you know your perspective not only at the state level but then how the federal government could could help better support states and localities like yours Absolutely. I think uh, the secretary kind of alluded to that, but really to me, the funder, the underlining thing is joining forces, uh, working with the EAC, having them uh, continue to partner with DHS and CISA to continue to push out information down to the network. Uh, I am now sitting on the local leadership council for the EAC. I currently serve as the vice chair of that. And I know one of the biggest things that we're trying in that organization is to continue to build the network between all 50 states, really make sure and that all the information from the federal government is being pushed down. The grants that are there, the HAVA funds, the security funds, uh, that are currently available, but then also to the secretary's point as well, continue to push for more and more funding. Here in Colorado, we did pass a couple of years ago a landmark uh, election funding bill that is the first in the nation where now the Secretary of State's office does have to reimburse 45% of an election that something on the state and federal uh, has on the ballot, which is huge because as we all know, local county governments, we're typically the ones that are footing that bill and it does become quite challenging when we are penny pinching every single taxpayer dollars we possibly can. It's not like we're out here trying to be spending all of it uh, in not a good educational way uh, and for the right purposes, uh, but we definitely have been con and continue to be underfunded. And so having that conversation at the national level and with our Secretary of State and the, our legislatures here, even at the state level, to have them understand just how critically important to the foundation of our government, uh, making sure that elections are run, with every opportunity for every voter to participate, but then making sure that the security and the integrity of it is high. It is really important that we continue to have those conversations. Uh, another big thing for me as well is to make sure that all electeds are really truly understanding what elections and how are and how they are run so that they won't be the ones that will perpetuate false information that won't be recycling that false election narrative and so calling on other electeds also i think is another thing that all of us need to be doing to call them out and say hey you know what my door is open come take a tour of the election process let me have that conversation with you because it all really starts at the federal level as well with our federal electeds not like I said, carrying on those false narratives of any type of funny business and elections. Uh, and so again, calling them out and having them a call to action for sure on that is a, one of the things I think all of us can continue to do and pushing back on that uh, and continuing that funding. Uh, and training is also going to be really important too making sure that every single county has the ability to have good cybersecurity training, good physical security training, uh, then making sure that these partnerships and the associations within the states are also very strong, again, to help support each other. I think the biggest thing that we've learned since 2020 is the larger our network and net, uh, net is to help and support each other, the better all of us are going to continue to be. Thank you so much. And Clara, as I go over to you, I'll also note uh, for, for the audience, um, 
Carly's in the middle of running a special vacancy election uh, because of a resignation from uh, on uh, a Republican Congressman Ken Buck re resigned in Colorado, and then uh, shortly after, Rep Gallagher in Wisconsin. So we've got sort of these two vacancies uh, in both states. Um, so Claire, going over to you, would love to uh, have you wrap us up here on this question before we open up for audience uh, question and answer. Yeah, I think for me, um, I'm in Wisconsin, which has the most disjointed, which we always brag about, uh, election administration in the nation. But what that means is that I administer elections at the municipal level, and so do 18 other, 1,800 other clerks. And then we have our county clerks, and then we have our state election commission. But so when I look at funding, um, really the need to have and recognize that at a municipal level, people's funding needs are different and that it might cost more to run an election in a major city or even out on a tribal reservation. You know, it, we're not comparing. I think oftentimes we, when we look at things like HAVA funding, we get a per capita number per voters, you know, allotment and that there's different needs related to election security, cybersecurity. Um, so really advocating for there to be federal funding that local governments have access to, um, where we're able to control what we're asking for and what our needs are, and not having statewide programs be kind of handed down to us and said, here's the money. Um, and we just received a grant for just under $800,000 of election administration funding to purchase just equipment that I needed, pallet jacks, electric pallet jacks, very glamorous things like that. Um, but unfortunately, on the April ballot, our voters will decide whether or not I can continue accepting private funding like that. So I think as we've seen other states make those changes and say that election administrators can't accept private funding, we have to be calling on our federal government to be filling in those holes because those holes are still going to exist and they're going to continue to be exposed if we aren't willing to recognize the true cost that it takes to administer an election. Such a great point to end on. And, you know, it's our nation's critical infrastructure. And when we look at other uh, critical other parts of critical infrastructure, there's much more money spent on, on those elements of our nation's critical infrastructure than in elections. And Congress needs to needs to adjust their thinking and, and truly invest in what is our critical election infrastructure uh, to ensure that elections remain secure, free, fair, and accessible to all. So thank you all so much. We're going to turn over to the Q&A. Um, so I'll uh, I think really any of you want to jump in on any of these questions, um, that's great. So the first one, uh, women juggle numerous roles and responsibilities in this economy, both at home and as individuals. What are some local and state solutions to get more women involved in election administration? Are there existing programs and systems that facilitate greater involvement of women from diverse backgrounds? And what should we pay attention to? If not, what steps can be taken to address this issue at the state and federal level? Anyone want to jump in on that one? I'll be, I'll give a brief initial thought. Um, and I think it's important to create a professional pipeline for election administrators, uh, particularly uh, among women. Um, I think, you know, as we know, some of our colleagues are appointed. It's truly professional. You come up as my two colleagues today, Carly and Claire, have talked about coming up kind of through the, the ranks of the county clerk's office to become a clerk um, or a chief election official of a local election um, area, I think, jurisdiction. I think that's really great, um, but it wasn't necessarily intentional, right? We sort of all three of us felt like we felt into the work, fell into the work. Um, there are programs like on the Democratic side, like Emerge, um, that train women to run for elected office at, you know, all sorts of various levels. I'm working sort of privately mentoring several candidates this year here in New Mexico who are looking to run for clerk uh, in their local jurisdiction uh, for terms that are opening up or running for re-election. Um, but I don't think what, what I'm trying to say here is that there needs to be, I believe, 
uh, a program uh, of some sort developed to really intentionally uh, identify, recruit, train, and help these individuals come into the right spots um, and encourage their professional development and growth and ability to run for and retain office. Um, I think that's work we need to do in this uh, election sphere to have highly qualified, excellent professionalism and uh, amazing integrity in our election officials. Great, thank you. Um, and this this question is, uh, I'm gonna break it up, I think into two parts because you've already answered some of this question, but it's from Ambassador Romer, who's a member of the National Council on Election Integrity with, with me. So thank you for being here, Ambassador. Um, so the question is, how do you respond to false claims that the 2020 election was stolen to build trust and confidence in our election system? What words and explanations work the most effectively from your experience? Uh, who wants to start? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, start. I think one of the first things that I do is I try to explain the history of how elections are and where we started from uh, in the early stages in Colorado, particularly because uh, one of the biggest things that they say, oh, well, you, you made it all mail ballot because it wanted you wanted to do this, this and this. And so really trying to actually take them back to the fundamental reasons and the history of how Colorado got to the election model that it is. And it is all because of voters. We listened to what the voters were saying. I mean, Amber, you know this very well. You were very much involved in a huge asset uh, back in 2013 when we changed the model that we currently have. Uh, and you know very well in Colorado, that's what we do. We listen to the voters and we actually change and adjust to meet their needs because that that's our job. We're, we're here to get the voters to vote. Uh, and so that's one of the biggest things that I know that has helped me is actually give them an education on how and why we came to the election model that we currently have and why is it important to keep it that way as well. So I know that that's been one of the biggest things that has helped me move the conversation along uh, to kind of alleviate some of those demands of, well, I want to go back to single day voting and only in person uh, to have them truly understand again that the reason why we're here is because we listen to the voters uh, and then actually sitting down and really trying to understand the what and the, and the why continuing to kind of ask that why, 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 which my, now my young son is helping me understand why it is so important to answer the why, why, whys all the time, uh, but really continuing to really try and get down to what is their actual fear, uh, trying to take away all of the, the regurgitation, trying to take away uh, what they continue to hear all the time in, in whatever avenue they're listening to, and really try and dig down to what really is rattling their bones uh, has always been something that I have found over the last few years have been where I have been able to take somebody and be successful in turning them to be actually an advocate and supporter of our election model here in Colorado and here in Well County. Thank you so much. Claire, did you want to add anything? I was just going to echo that. I think the most powerful um, way to negate something is to show someone else well, tell me what your concerns are. Let me walk you through that process. Um, so especially with observers, I've been really trained our staff to embrace observers and to say out loud what you're doing because it might feel absolutely insane at first, but it's helping the person watching you really learn. Um, and I think that that is where we've seen the most movement, at least here in Milwaukee, is when people come and observe our operations, we're willing to tell them why we're doing things and what we're doing. And it's really, I think, clarified a lot of things for them. Great. Um, so final question before I turn it over to Kara. Um, so there's a couple questions actually in the chat that relate to one is what can everyday people do to support election workers right now? Another is about the, the fear that some volunteers have about serving as an election official, given some of the things that you shared. So what, how would you all kind of respond to that? How do you encourage election workers, even in your own offices? And what, and what, what can everyday people do right now um, from your perspectives to support this ecosystem that you're all in of, of election administration so that 2024 hopefully is, uh, it, it at least starts to improve in terms of some of the, some of the, some of the issues that we continue to see. Who wants to 
jump well, in. I'll jump yeah. in. Um, okay. So that was a really huge fear of mine going into 2022 is what our workers feel safe coming back, especially those who just work on election day at polling places. And we have followed up and asked, we send out a survey after every election. Um, in addition to the training that we do, we've done a lot of de-escalation training, training our chief inspectors who to call, when to call, don't hesitate to call. But then we've done follow-up surveys and I'm really always relieved and happy um, that even in these surveys where someone could choose to be anonymous, we ask them about, did you feel safe on election day? And at least here in the city and knock on wood, I'm gonna find some real wood to knock on. Um, everyone has felt safe so far. They aren't reporting increased concerns about feeling safe in person. Um, even when we've had conflicts arise, they felt like, you know, I was able to just handle it calmly and not get agitated and not lose my temper. Um, and then just making sure that they know that we're not expecting people who work two to four times a year to handle complicated situations where we have them call us. I will walk through and explain to someone on the phone this conspiracy theory that they want to engage with you about and that's not your job. You're not the, you know, you don't live and breathe elections like we do. Um, so that's been most important to us is to make sure that we are constantly asking for feedback so we can identify if an issue were to arise um, and making sure that everyone, no matter whether it's coming into our office every day or just going to a polling place a couple times a year that they feel safe. Okay, Carly, Secretary Toulouse Oliver, do you want to weigh in on that? Or I have one other question that you could weigh in on if you want. No? Okay. I'll ask this one final and both if you if either of you want to provide a final comment, and then I'll uh, close us out and turn us over to Kara. Uh, so one of the final questions, which is fairly quick. How do you all practice self-care and take care of your mental health, especially with pressing deadlines and children and families? I'll start. I'm unabashedly uh, a pro uh, mental health advocate. Uh, everyone should, in my opinion, everyone should have a therapist, um, whether you know, you feel you need one or don't. And I think it's really important to normalize the fact that we live um, in really stressful times, especially the last four years in this country. Those of us who are election officials um, are dealing with tons of challenges. Um, I've been going regularly to therapy since I started running elections. Uh, coincidence or not, I don't know. But um, I think it's really important. And I just want to put it out there. You know, we have gotten to a place in our society where I think this needs to be normalized. We can't, uh, you know, consider people crazy for wanting to take care of and address their mental health needs um, and, and writing them off and, and, you know, thinking that they are less than. And I think at this point in time, more than ever, it's really important for those of us um, who are in this profession to get all of the self-care that we possibly can uh, and to prioritize that, whether it's mental, physical, taking a spa day, taking a mental health day, going out into nature and doing what we love. I was just up at Taos this weekend with my son, who's a ski racer, right? Whatever we need to do. Um, I think we should prioritize that uh, in this, in these times. Hey, great. Uh, Carly, do you want to I, I want to say I absolutely agree with the secretary in this point. Uh, absolutely should be uh, talking to anybody and everybody that you can. If you don't feel comfortable talking to a licensed therapist, you've got all of us other election officials that we can all kind of uh, choose whatever drink you want to choose from and uh, call us up anytime because I'm pretty sure there's multiple days we're all working 24 hours a day. So uh, where somebody's always available to you to talk to you because uh, nobody knows what we're going through truly besides each other. Uh, it is hard to have conversations with people who haven't worked elections but it is important that we do have that conversation as the secretary is saying it is important that we do prioritize making sure that we we are not only physically strong but we're mentally strong and emotionally strong uh, throughout this whole entire time uh, when we are facing these different unique challenges uh, i myself definitely agree therapy is a, a wonderful tool that more and more people really should be utilizing uh, and i'm grateful that there are so many resources out there that can uh, give it to you for either discounted or even free 
free. Uh, so you can, I mean, there's really no, no reason why you're any shame that you should uh, have when you are re going out and reaching for that. And that's not just an elections field. That's all, all fields. I am in my opinion. Uh, and I'm, I'm also in agreement getting out. And for me is uh, I've got horses. And so I go out and smell their noses there. That's the best aroma therapy there is for me. Uh, and then also just hearing my little kiddos laugh. Uh, and I, I am a unique duck. Uh, I, I don't drink anything but uh, Pepsi. So I do have a, a whole case of Pepsi that I can I can day drink with all day long <laughs> if I need to. Thanks, Carly. Kara, over to you. I, I, I tried to fit a couple extra questions in there so you can close us Thank out. Thank you. Well, that's Kara. the most important, Amber. Thank you. I'm glad we got those questions in. I just want to thank you all on behalf of Pivotal Ventures and Issue One for joining us, for, for sharing your stories and your experiences, and most importantly, for the work that you are doing as the front lines of our democracy every day. Um, I think as many people who are joining us saw 80% of the election administration workforce is women. Uh, and, and that also means, as you all shared, that the disproportionate number of threats and harassment is also and abuse is also directed at women. And so this is this has to be a key priority for us. Um, I want to thank Pivotal Ventures for supporting this work. Uh, for those of you who are interested in becoming more involved, please feel free to contact us at Issue One. We would love to have your involvement as well. And I can say that Issue One is fully committed to supporting our election workers this year and to doing everything that we can to ensure that our elections are safe and secure and that those working are fully supported. So thank you all again for joining us. We appreciate you.